position dictates, I now temporarily hand over to the highest ranking Scandinavian in the room to introduce the, I can't do it again, the lecture. <laughs> uh, I, I hand over to Runar, obviously. Thank you, thank you. Uh, should we... So I think it's no exaggeration to say that this year's speaker is a legend in his own time. Um, he's celebrating 10 years of Scala, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And best known for his work on, on Akka, this, this man has flat mapped a lot of shit. <laughs> Some say that he owns a suit made entirely out of threads that he caught walking. <laughs> and that he has his children set up in a RAID 1 plus 0 configuration. <laughs> they are being striped as we speak. <laughs> so without further ado, our speaker for this year's AFL Yoko's lecture, Victor Klein. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Alright, I figured uh, it would be more serious if I uh, Looked like a real scientist, so <laughs> working on it. Can you hear me? Are we good? Are we good? All right. So can everybody see the screen? Yeah. Yes? Yes. So first of all, I think we should take a bit of time to appreciate the number of puns that I managed to work into the title. <laughs> uh, there's like all kinds of like evaluation uh, terms like evaluation of terms, effects, right? Uh, also, John, where are you? Yeah. Do, do, do you uh, recognize the picture? I do. Yes. So this is an authentic picture from uh, the Lake District. Uh, the, uh, right, John? I think the quote was let you fix that. Yes, the, 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 yeah, I fixed it for you. Um, so, also in this presentation, there might be dragons. And for, for you, um, let me see if I can, I can zoom in here. <laughs> no. So, I'll read it out loud instead. So, there is a disclaimer at the end of the page, like mainly intended for entertain entertainment purposes. Uh, some of the content may or may not represent reality. Uh, your mileage may vary. So, just keep in mind. Um, are we ready? Awesome. So, I'm really sorry, but the title was complete clickbait. Um, this is not what the presentation is about at all. Uh, so, yeah, S sorry about that. Um, but I was sort of worried that you would choose some other session. So, uh, I don't know. Needed to do my very best. Um, John, do you rec re remember Scala Days Copenhagen this year? Uh, not everyone. I think there are a couple of others as well, but I don't know. You said it was something like interaction with the audience was nice. So I, I decided to pick you first. <laughs> you don't remember it. So, um, the, I think it was the introduction or you, you had some sort of speech to introduce. Yes. And, and, and I was sort of fashionably late. Um, I had been stuck in the hallway. Uh, talking to people because that is what I tend to do at conferences and I'm fashionably late and I can't really find the main room for some reason uh, which is weird because it was really huge this room and um, so I walk in try to sneak in try to find some place to sit everything is completely packed and uh, what I see is just a huge picture of myself on the screen and uh, I don't know what you would do in that situation, but uh, I was uh, sort of, uh, perhaps I can sort of slowly and quietly move out of the room uh, without anybody noticing. But uh, th then you said, oh, uh, where is he? And I was sort of like, hello. <laughs> uh, I don't know what the context around this is, uh, but apparently it was good, so that was good for me. But uh, I think at some point I need to get back at you for that. Um, somehow. Perhaps today, perhaps some other day. Um, all right. So, you can never have too many disclaimers 
I think. Um, does everybody have enough salt at their table? Uh, because you're going to need a lot of salt. And of course, um, you need to listen to what I say because I'm some sort of scientist here, so I, I'm some sort of authority figure doing some sort of lecture thing. Um, so here we go. What is the most difficult thing in computer science? Naming things. So let's tackle this head on. So I was invited to give a lecture. I don't consider myself a person that does lecturing much, so I, I decided that I had to figure out what it means. So apparently, I'm doing the Eya Fjetla Jökult. Is that right, somehow? I did it. I, I, I had you on repeat, Runar. Like, just that <laughs> section, I just repeated it. Um, and so, naming is really hard, right? So we need to figure out what stuff are, so that we can do stuff. Um, so, what is a lecture? So, I consulted the internet, uh, which of course is true. And uh, one of the examples of the definition of, of lecture is uh, an educational talk to an audience, especially one of students in a u university. And I don't know, like it doesn't feel like we're in a university here, right? It's not that kind of setting. Kind of if you s squint a bit or a lot or use a lot of salt. Um, but so it's not an educational talk to an audience. So of course, if there's a one there, there has to be like a two, right? So what is the other? Uh, the other is a long, serious speech, especially one given as a scolding or reprimand. OK. Um, thanks for inviting me, John. Uh, I think I sort of messed up on the first part already. Um, and just to be sure that the words are correct, I actually looked up what scolding means, and apparently it means reprimand. <laughs> so I don't know, it, it seems like redundant in this sentence. So it's like, okay, I'm going to give everybody a reprimand. I, that doesn't feel right. So let me see if I can do something else. All right. Ten years as a scholar. I figured sometime earlier this year that this is my tenth year as a scholar programmer. Um, the two there is because uh, the X is, is the Roman numeral for ten, right? But if, if you look really closely, there, it's the Roman numeral for IO. <laughs> says, says there. Uh, so there is a Roman numeral for I.O., uh, which I think is very uh, suiting at this point. Um, uh, so I need to talk about this 10 years of Scala, I feel like. Do, are you interested in he hearing a little bit about sort of a, a journey of 10 years in Scala? Yeah? Yeah? Yes. yeah? Cool. Uh, so um, just before that, just to sort this slide out, uh, uh, the typeface matters. Right? Because otherwise, it, you can't really see it. It's like I.O., but it's 10, but it's not. So I'm, go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go for it. I'm, I'm going to bring up fonts. Um, fonts are important. Uh, and uh, I need to do a lecture, right? So I need to come with some sort of recommendations or important things. And, and if I make some suggestions, I think that we should use Fura code for terminals. And we should use Droid Sans Mono for the editor. Uh, but I think most importantly when it comes to fonts, and I think there are a lot of people in the audience who might disagree with this, uh, I think the most important thing is that we decide for ourselves. Can we agree that? We don't fight over which font that we use. We just pick one ourselves. No comments to that. Comics, I actually had Comic Sans on the slide earlier uh, for, for presentations, but uh, yeah. Then I didn't have Comic Sans myself, and then it sort of uh, fell through. As long as they have a free software license. As long as they have a free software license? OK. Um, this is my lecture. Uh, you, you, so, so actually, speaking of fonts, I actually did a, a, a keynote at a conference, and 
After the keynote, there was an attendee who came up to me and said, during your entire presentation, I was wondering to myself, what font is that? <laughs> awesome person, awesome person. <laughs> All right, so uh, 10 years ago, um, so, hmm, 10 years ago, what happened 10 years ago? My memory is sort of like the years sort of blend into each other. I, do you remember what happened exactly 10 years ago? Anybody? No? Me neither. So I, I, I had to jog my memory quite a bit here. Um, and so, uh, even more disclaimers here. I, my my memory is like, it could be, could be 11 years. I don't know. I, I, I try to figure it out, but l l let's see. Uh, so, uh, at the time, uh, I was doing a lot of Java development. So t let's just transport ourselves 10 years back, and I'm doing a lot of Java hacking. And uh, so, uh, my colleague at the time, John. Uh, who uh, is uh, super awesome, one of the most brilliant people I know, uh, he, he told me that he had found a new programming language. Uh, and it was called Scala, and that I should give it a try. And, and I did. So I started to hack on, on Scala, uh, which is pretty cool. So I, I, I'm a Java developer, and I start to hack on a new language. Hmm, cool. And I figure that this thing with like object-oriented programming and functional programming is like bacon lambda. It's like one of the best things there is. <laughs> so I had a eureka moment as I started hacking with Scala. I, I remembered even further, I think even 10 years before that when I was hacking in C, I did a lot of like function pointer passing style, like passing around functions in C, and there was like Cool, this is sort of like passing around function pointers, but without pointers and, and yeah, <laughs> whatever. Sort of like that. All right. So Scala back in 2007, I went back in, in I traveled in time in my, in my uh, email archive, which is probably one of the, the least interesting ways of traveling in time. But uh, this is actually my first email to the Scala user mailing list. And it says, I've written a lot of NIO code in the past, or NIO code in the past. If you need some input or help, just give me a notice. Look, helpful, right? Just trying to help. So it turns out that I sent that as a reply to Philip Haller. He's sadly not here today. But one interesting complication is I've written a lot of NIO code. Hmm. Plot thickens. Do you know of JSR 51? <laughs> Java NIO. Who was on the expert group? Hmm. A Miles. Miles. That's an interesting coincidence. The first email I sent to the mailing list turns out to be about something that Miles was involved with. Where is Miles? Mm. Where is Miles? Who warned him? <laughs> right? Coincidence? I think not. All right, so I start hacking on, on Scala code. Let's fast forward. So this is the Eyjafjallajökull Jökult lecture. Again, right? <laughs> Pressure is on, right? How, do we have any survivors from, from Scala Days 2010 here? Anyone? Raise your hands. We have two there. OK. So this is going to be an interesting story. Oh, three? Cool. All right. So have you heard, have you heard the stories? The legends? So I went back in time in my, in my uh, photos folder. Uh, if, if you see the person there in the back, that's me. Clearly, one of the side effects uh, can be uh, style related. I don't know. Uh, but the, uh, the guy to the right is actually the same John who introduced me to Scala in the first place. And uh, the gentleman in the, uh, in the leather jacket is Jonas Bonier. And the person uh, to the left is somebody who was pitching some sort of startup idea. 
so 2010, first Scala days, first time we meet sort of the, the Scala community in one place, uh, exchanging some interesting projects that we're working on. And can you guess what happened next? What happens? There's a volcano eruption, right? This is where the, the chapter of the lecture, which is called The Escape from Lausanne, starts. So all of Europe was completely locked down in terms of air travel. And everybody was trying to get home. And apparently, Germany is in the middle of Europe. And apparently, everybody's traveling across Europe. And I needed to get to Sweden, which is at the very north. So I needed to go through Germany. But everybody was trying to go through Germany at the same time. So at the very last moment, we tried to secure train tickets. That was nice. Like, we have train tickets. We can get home, right? We have tickets. And how many of you have, have uh, uh, gone on a train ride in Switzerland? Train ride, train ride? It's sort of like a roller coaster, right? It's sort of like um, going through the mountains and uh, one, uh, one second you're looking into the lake somewhere and the other second you're looking straight into a mountain or something. It's, it's, it's a very interesting uh, experience, especially as you're trying to get home when there's a volcano eruption. What happens, I have to look at the, because this is a very complex, complex story here. So we're going through Germany we had a seven hour ride to Hamburg. Hamburg, I don't know if we can see it here on the map. Oh, it's up there. So seven hours ride to Hamburg. And uh, the train is so full that essentially everybody's standing up. Essentially everybody. So A, you don't go anywhere because you can't move. So no food, no water, no nothing. Uh, you sleep standing, if you can. Uh, some people were actually sort of sleeping underneath the, the seats. Like, it was a very, very uh, stressful moment. And uh, in the middle of the night, now the, the city's not marked out here, but the city's Mainz in, in southern uh, Germany. And I think around 2 a.m., we're woken, uh, those of us who stand and sleep, or, or sort of woken, by somebody saying something in German. We think it's the driver uh, of the train. Uh, and the driver of the train is saying, once we have translated uh, what he's saying, I won't run a single meter unless 50 people leave the train. If you're stuck on a train, it's in the middle of the night, you don't know where you are, would you leave the train? <laughs> Nip. So two hours later, when, uh, when we discovered that nobody's going to leave the train, uh, they actually figured out that you could uh, have uh, other trains pick up people who live nearby and such, offer uh, people who live nearby to exit the train and take other trains. But it was sort of nice to be in Mainz for two hours, between two and four, in the middle of the night. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, and, and then we uh, continued to try to sleep standing. I think I secured a seat. I'm not sure if John was that lucky. Uh, I think Jonas had secured a seat as well. But we wake up at 7 a.m. in the morning with the driver again saying, uh, the train will not stop in, in, in Hamburg. Oh, really? Uh, that's nice. Uh, okay, it will apparently will stop in some suburb outside of Hamburg. So okay, what do we do now? We need to get home. We've been sort of awake all night and we're outside of Hamburg and every single body on that train wants to go to Hamburg. So apparently there is something called the S-Bahn which is sort of like a commuter train. And everybody's sort of leaving the train, trying to get to the other train, the S-Bahn train. And are you familiar with the concept of escalators? Escalators? Uh, so 
one runs in one direction and the other in the opposite direction, right? Everybody was using the one that like was moving them in the right direction and nobody was using the one that was moving in the opposite direction. Ah. So we ran like crazy uh, with all of our sort of bags in the wrong direction of the escalator uh, and, and sort of uh, cut in front of the queue. It's sort of like uh, very on the, on the spot problem solving uh, skills there. Uh, so now we're on the S-Bahn to Hamburg. It's like, whoa, we, we're almost there. Uh, we, we just need to get to the, the, the main station. And we get to the main station and everybody in Europe has found the main station of Hamburg. Uh, it was extremely packed, to say the least. Uh, I, I, th I think, like, if the train is full, and then you add another 100% capacity to the train, and then you add another 100% outside of the train, and then, like, 50% extra on the, like, the, the stairs to the, to the platform. Uh, about that packed it was. So, Somehow, we figured out that there was going to be some sort of buses that could take us to, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but it's Puttgarten. So it's uh, North Germany, and there's some ferries. There's some ferries from Puttgarten to Denmark. So we're making progress here. <laughs> Apparently, the part of the population that had found the main station of Hamburg has also found the bus stop outside of the main station of Hamburg. So we, we still have issues. But uh, it turns out that we, we managed to secure seats. So now we're on buses. Like, imagine this situation. You're on buses now, but we're only going to get to Puttgart. Apparently, if you didn't know this, nobody takes the bus to Puttgart to go on the ferry. Because that doesn't make sense. Everybody, like, goes on their car or takes the train, and apparently the train can stop on the ferry and go to Denmark and stuff like that. So you aren't necessarily just a passenger on the ferry. So it's really awkward when you get off the ferry and you don't have a method of transport. You're like, oh, <laughs> hello. Uh, what do we do now? So we've managed to secure our, our sort of trip to Denmark, but now we're sort of outside of the ferry station and we don't know where to go. So finally, we find a train, again, train, that we can go to Copenhagen. And then from Copenhagen, we manage to actually get home. So we're talking about like 24 hours, like seven trains, multiple ferries, all kinds of stuff to just get home from like a two and a half hour flight between Copenhagen and Geneva. Uh, so I think that is why this is called the Eyjaf Hitler Jökult lecture because of what, what we went through together, the, 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 the survivors of the first uh, Scala days. All right, so work, working our way forward. Uh, so we, we, we were starting a company called TypeSafe. Uh, so Jonas is to the right, uh, 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 a gentleman called Peter Vlachter is in the middle. I'm, I don't know what happened, uh, I'm there. I don't know if I just woke up or I don't know. But Paul, Paul is in the middle. And can you see what his shirt says? It says, I don't work here. <laughs> Good. All right. So I guess we're done with the introduction. Uh, OK. Um, all right. Some sort of I.O. error. Uh, all right. <laughs> all right. All right. Let's go ahead. All right. So apparently we're doing some sort of lecture here. So I have to have some sort of, I have to say something important. So you feel like I learned something important tonight. Uh, so uh, apparently, looking backward, in history on my 10 years of Scala, I've noticed some trends. I've noticed some trends. And uh, I guess you could help me a bit. I'm not necessarily sure. I've done some research, but I'm not necessarily sure if I got this correct. So could you please help me here? 
Um, so, do you remember what was the hip thing in 2007 in the Scala, Scala user ecosystem? Do we have any, do we have any suggestions? XML. XML? Wasn't that like in 2004? <laughs> uh, anyone else? Framework. Sorry? Framework. What? Lift. Lift? In the Scala, just, just Scala itself. Like I, I wanted to really focus, this is Scala world, right? We need to, this is purely Scala focused. Cake. Cake. We have a winner. Lots of cakes, John, lots of cakes. Lots, John, lots of cakes. Also, I'm not saying it, <laughs> but apparently it was really popular in 2007. So 2008, do we have any suggestions? New collections? Anyone else? What? You have to speak up. Ah, we actually have four comprehensions. That was pretty cool. Four comprehensions, pretty cool. Also, <laughs> also, Wait, you say AFL yokult monads? I can probably, I can probably, we can make one. We'll open a PR later. 2009, do I have any suggestions? Symbolic operators. Very, very cool back in 2009. Also, uh, there's uh, that word again. And uh, so we're fast forwarding to 2010. It's only seven years ago. What happened? We had collections. Collections was pretty cool, like new collections and stuff. And monads. 2011, it retees. Yeah, I read your blog post recently, Ronar. Nothing is hidden on the internet. <laughs> also, there were uh, monads. 2012, now they're free. <laughs> now they're free. As in Wi-Fi. <sighs> 2013. Macros, macros, yeah. and monads. <laughs> 14, what happened in 14? Now streams are really, really hip. I don't know if, if that's a word people use anymore. Is it cool? What, what's, I don't know, I'm getting too old. Too, yeah, it's too, monads. Uh, 15 though, it's also streams, more streams uh, and monads. Um, so I was looking at 2016 and it's all like, it was a lot of Scala JS back in 2016, but there were also monads. <laughs> and this year, is it Scala native? I don't know. Is it monads? We're, we're not through with 2017. We can still affect the statistics here. Could push monads out of top two. Uh, and also importantly, if we look a bit into the future, what would you suggest that 2008 would be? What's 18 would be? Is it monads? Actors? Yeah, mo mo not monads. We can, we can make it monads. <laughs> but we can also choose to make it something else. <laughs> All right. So, speaking of trends, uh, if we don't think about sort of what's the cool thing right now, but what about we think about trends as in how does it end? Right? So if we do something or use something, what's the end result? Right? So a good example is, uh, imagine that you would always clean slightly less 
then you were uh, uh, making a mess. What would the end result extrapolated over time be? Right? It would be really messy, right? But on the other hand, if we just tidy up a slightly, slightly uh, bigger bit than we, than, than we mess up, then the end result will actually be completely and utterly cleaned, right? So I think from a lecture point of view, I think it's more important to think about the trends of stuff than things that are trends. Deep, right? All right, let me, let me just get some water. I don't really fit well in a lab coat, for sure. All right. So, what else? Style. Hmm, what about style? The most code I've written in Scala has been fairly sort of perhaps focused on concurrency or parallelization or distribution or high performance and stuff like that. And of course, that affects what the style of the code looks like. But I think I've had a couple of realizations about Scala code that, that I would like to share. So, all right, did you see it? Did you see it? What was it? What? See again. Did you, do you see it? Do you see it? Tabs? You see it? You see it? You see it? Are you seeing it? You're not seeing it? You're not seeing it. You see the return statement there? <laughs> right? I'm slightly disappointed here. What I found when it comes to style, I don't write return. That's pretty interesting, pretty cool. And it turns out that code is actually pretty easily readable once it's sort of its, its final expression is the end result, right? So th that's what I like about sort of Scala as a, as a style of writing Scala code. But I think it's also about shapes. I think a lot about shapes. When I'm, when, I'm, when I'm programming in Scala. So, like the shape of a fold or the shape of a scan or the shape of a map or, or an unfold or any uh, of sort of the transformations that are available. And I found that this is really helpful when I write my code. So if I can sort of untangle the solution into different shapes and try to fill in those shapes with the transformations, the code almost writes itself. Which is pretty interesting, because what I found when I write Scala code is I typically think before I type anything. Like, I don't even create a class or add some parameters and add some getters and setters or anything, because Scala lets you focus on solving the problem first, in my experience. And I think Scala also helps us think in structures. Because Scala has pretty awesome persistent and immutable types, right? Tuples, sequences, maps, sets, vectors. Thinking in structure and thinking in shapes is really helpful, I've found, for structuring and writing code. So what is the structure of my information and what is the shape of my transformations? Also, Const lists are not lists, they are stacks. Can you please repeat after me? Const lists are not lists, they are stacks. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> All right. As I mentioned before, I found that I can actually think for quite a long time before I write some code. And Hmm, how, why is that? Because if we have a REPL, the, the, like the puns are so bad. These, John, are you seeing this? I don't get it. 
I'm sorry. I'm so, sorry, John. Sorry, John. But the REPL in Scala is extremely useful, no matter which REPL you use. Being able to experiment with the shapes and the structures that you're trying to solve your problem with, being able to just type that in and getting an immediate response is extremely valuable to me. I've also found that writing recursive methods is much more easier for me to reason about. Of course, I started as a Java developer before I just switched to Scala. And it takes a while before you sort of think in that sort of recursive way again. But tail recursion, even if it's slightly limited, is actually pretty useful because you can define your transformation before you decide to execute it. And you can like, re, like, execute it multiple times. It, it's extremely useful. So I write a lot of tail recursive uh, uh, methods as a result of that. And takes us to the next thing, closest sensible scope. Being able to define methods within methods is extremely valuable because it allows you to put context where it's actually necessary. So if you have to put all your methods in the sort of shared class scope, then there's no context to the methods because they're all sharing the same namespace. But you can actually put methods where, they are, where, where their context is apparent. It also allows you to move them around, move them in, in scopes or move them out in scopes. Also allows you to give business level names to methods where the type doesn't necessarily describe what, what the context of the business is. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Also, a favorite of mine, uh, Pat Helen's uh, paper, I think it's in ACM, Immuta Immutability Changes Everything. Having immutability at, the, at your fingertips changes how you reason about values, right? Being able to have a fact and know that that fact doesn't change unless I want it to change, that is extremely powerful. So I, I tend to recommend to use persistent data structures or like, like just sprinkle final everywhere uh, because it's so much easier to reason about code if you know that things don't change. But this is a good thing because I see a lot of Scala code where it's not apparent that things are not final. So if you write a case class, that's not final. can be extended. So I recommend just put a final wherever you can until your code breaks and figure out why this thing needed to be mutable in the first place. Uh, so I, I tend to be very liberal with adding final everywhere. All right. So I think it's important. There's from time to time, there are talks about uh, a powerful language or an expressive language or being able to express things in a language. Uh, and I think there is a, a, a difference between uh, computational power or being able to execute code and being able to reason about code or being able to express your solution in that code for others to read and for yourself to understand later. And I think those are separate. So I think we should talk a bit about the difference here. So apparently, this is a paper by, by Stephen Dolan. Uh, the x86 move instruction is Turing complete, which means that you can write any x86 program using only the move instruction. Extreme power, right? You can do anything. But what does that mean to the programmer if like, all we ever had was the x86 move instruction as our language of expressing the solutions that we're trying to like, express. Apparently, there's also a way of using the Intel MMU uh, fault code trapping uh, and to compute with that. So you don't even need instructions. Uh, you just need the, the memory management unit. Anyway, 
I think it's important to be able to clearly articulate the solution, right? To the problems that we're working on. But both to the machine to execute efficiently, to our colleagues so that we can communicate the solution that we just came up with or found a bug with or that we're working on, but also to ourselves. Because there's, there's this very common thing that I go back to code I wrote six months ago and I'm like, whoa, what happens here? And I think that is what expressiveness should be. Not what you can express, but to who. Can we express stuff so that we can understand it, so that our colleagues can understand it, and so that machine can understand it? That's what I like about Scala. So just to summarize, um, I'll, let, I'll let, let all of you go back to enjoying your evening. Um, I would like to thank everybody who's made my decade in Scala awesome. Um, perhaps the most, I, I, could, I could probably spend an hour just name dropping people that I would like to thank. Um, but I think the most shocking um, revelation is that I started programming Scala because my, my, my colleague John uh, told me that there was an awesome programming language that I should do. And for some reason, uh, I'm standing here in front of you today. That's pretty awesome. I, I did not know that. So learn cool new stuff, uh, enjoy the conference, and uh, thank you. <laughs>